All right, welcome back to Matt Flex and Chill. This is your host, Rachel Gregory, and today I have another solo Q&A episode for you. So before we dive into the questions today, I do want to just mention that my weekly newsletter, we are now in, I believe it's the third or fourth week of the newsletter. So every Friday I send out a weekly newsletter that has something that I've learned um, for myself throughout the week. I uh, review the podcasts that have launched that week. I give you a recipe of the week, dive into um, some previous blog posts and a few other fun stuff. So it's called the Friday Flex. So every Friday you'll receive an email from me which will include all the things I just talked about. So if you're not signed up yet, I will add a link in the show notes to sign up to that or you can just go to killingitketo.com backslash newsletter add your name and email and you'll be added to the list. All right, let's get into the questions. We have a bunch of great ones today, so I wanna dive right in. Okay, so the first question, when mountain biking in 85 plus temperatures, which and how much electrolytes should you replenish each hour to prevent getting behind on hydration being in ketosis? Okay, great question. So. I am very familiar with uh, different hydration techniques. Um, I did triathlons back in college um, when I was uh, went to the University of Miami, living in Miami, cycling in 85 plus temperatures. Um, so I'm very familiar with this. It's not, it's obviously not the same as mountain biking, but um, pretty similar. Um, and then I also got my undergrad degree in athletic training, so we had lots of classes on. <laughs> Um, hydration and making sure that our athletes did not get dehydrated and so I kind of have a a lot of background in this Um, we did talk about I mean one thing that you know I learned in college or I guess yeah one thing that I learned in college in my time as in athletic training you know was all about kind of pumping Gatorade into the athletes because of the electrolytes and because obviously the sugar and the carbs and things like that I'm not gonna go down the Gatorade rabbit hole today, um, but I will say that I've learned a lot since then, and I know that um, although sports drinks can have their place, I think focusing more on actual overall hydration and salt and electrolytes in general can really do a lot more um, than just pumping yourself full of sugar. So anyway, that's another tangent I can go off of, go off on. Um, but in general, everyone is different when it comes to hydration and electrolyte replenishment and all of that, because it really depends on, you know, your body size, um, you know, your rate of sweat loss, also like the climate that you are performing your activity in. So whether it's, um, for example, You know, if you're cycling in Florida where it's super humid and you probably are sweating a lot versus if you're in Arizona and you're mountain biking, it's super dry, so you're probably not sweating as much. Um, So climate matters, body body size matters, your rate of sweat loss, all of these things matter. So the biggest thing here is to just make sure that you're hydrating with water and replenishing salt and other electrolytes every day all day so you don't want to just you know wait till right before you exercise or you know wait to pay attention to it only on the days that you do you know say ride your mountain bike or whatever it may be you have to be staying hydrated you know all day every day Um, and there's a few ways that you can easily monitor your hydration levels you've probably heard a few of these a few of these already Um, the main one is you know, just looking at the color of your pee. That's the easiest way. Um, So if it's, I'll just, usually you can look at a chart and kind of see, you know, the different colors and what's hydrated versus not. Um, So I'll just kind of go through it. So pale yellow to clear is obviously normal, indicates that you're well hydrated. Um, If your pee is a light yellow and transparent, it's also, you know, indicated that it's normal and that you are at that ideal hydration status hydration status. Um, A pale honey transparent color indicates normal hydration, but it may mean that you need to uh, rehydrate soon. And then anything darker than that, anything darker than like a pale honey, you definitely need to hydrate as soon as possible. It's probably already too late. You're probably, um, if you're at that stage, it's really on the way to dehydration. So 
you definitely want to pay attention to that. Um, another solid way, and this is something that we used to do with our athletes all the time, especially during preseason, um, when they would have uh, multiple daily workouts, is you would you weigh yourself uh before and after your activity to see how much uh, weight you lost. So you can either weigh yourself daily, and especially if you're already fairly lean and you're an athlete, if you notice a significant drop in your weight, it probably suggests that you should increase your fluid intake. So you can do this two ways. Obviously, weigh your, weighing yourself daily if you are someone who, for example, mountain bikes on a daily basis, weighing yourself before and after that activity to see if there is any significant drops in weight, um, meaning that you lost a lot of sweat or things like that, that can be another indication of your hydration status. Um, in general, so just to give you some numbers, in general, when I recommend, you know, again, I said that you want to be thinking about this every single day. Like you shouldn't just be thinking about hydration and electrolytes on the days that you mountain bike. You want to be thinking about staying hydrated every single day. So in general, I recommend for my clients, and and honestly, this doesn't this isn't really backed by any science, um, but at least gives you somewhere to start. So I recommend that all of my clients get at least half their body weight in ounces per day. That's like the bare minimum. Um, and we're talking about water here. I'm going to get into electrolytes in a second, but at least half your body weight in ounces per day. Um, is a good place to start. So for example, if you weigh 160 pounds, you would need at least 80 ounces of water per day. Again, that's the bare minimum. So if you're sweating, you're active, you're working out multiple times a day, you'll definitely, definitely need more. Again, and I'm just saying this is not like backed by science or, or anything. This is just a starting place and um, gives you some numbers to work with. So in terms of hydration, or sorry, so in terms of electrolyte replacement, um, I would say that there are a bunch of different electrolyte supplements out there, especially nowadays. The biggest thing is just start with salt. Um, start with the high quality salt. Um, put some in your water. Make sure you're salting your food throughout the day. I like Redmond Real Salt. And then you can test out and play around with different electrolyte supplements. Um, so... I like the brand Element, uh, L-M-N-T, I believe it is. That's a good brand. It's by Rob Wolf. Um, and then also Ultimal Replenisher is another good brand. Again, it all comes back to you as an individual. And there's a lot of um, there's a lot of different things that go into this. So I can't give you exact numbers, but it really just comes down to testing out um, what works for you. So in terms of hydration, making sure that you're staying hydrated all day, every day, um, and make sure you're replenishing, you know, on the bike while you're on the bike. And then just test out different electrolyte supplements and different um, different amounts that work for you, you know. So if you're cramping and things like that, maybe you need a little bit more electrolytes and, and water. If you are feeling good, maybe you're at that right amount. But again, it all depends on you and, you know, your rate of sweat loss, your body size, um, things like that. So hopefully that makes sense. There's also a lot of conflicting information out there. Um, I did a little bit of dive, I, I did a little bit of digging into this question and I actually came across a great podcast with Ben Greenfield and Dr. Tim Notes where they talk all about hydration and replenishing electrolytes for uh, cyclists in particular and then also just athletes in general. So I'm going to link that episode in the show notes for you to check out. Um, it goes it's really a deep dive into all the science and kind of application of this with Ben Greenfield and Dr. Tim Notes. So definitely check that out for uh, further information on this question. All right, next question. What are your favorite HIIT workouts if you don't have a machine or a hill? Okay, so if you don't know what HIIT stands for, it stands for, this is H-I-I-T, High Intensity Interval Training. So HIIT is basically just a short, intense bout of all-out anaerobic exercise, followed by a set period of rest. And really, it should be all out exercise. So there are many ways to perform a HIIT workout, but they all stem from two, two basic principles. The first one, alternating between short work and rest periods, like I mentioned. And the second principle, work periods are intended to be, again, all out exercise. Um, so that is what traditionally HIIT means, um, just, just to be clear on that. Um, some people, they think they're doing HIIT, but they're really doing maybe more moderate intensity interval training. With HIIT, you shouldn't be able to go more than, um, like, 
I don't know, 30 seconds to a minute at most. Um, or it depends on obviously your, um, your conditioning and all of that, but HIT should is again, it's all out exercise with a period of rest in between. So the work to rest ratios can be changed to form a variety of different workout routines. One of the most popular, which you probably heard of is Tabata. So Tabata training is 20 seconds of work followed by 10 seconds of rest for a total of eight rounds. So that's what a traditional Tabata is. And that is a total of four minutes. Um, So 20 seconds work, 10 seconds rest, eight rounds, and a total of four minutes. So when I'm doing HIT, there's actually a really cool app. It's called Gym Boss Interval Interval Timer. So it's a free app. You can download it, but you can preset um, different HIT workouts, so different time intervals to go off. Um, So it's kind of like a, what's it called? It's kind of like a, what is the word? Just a, a, a hit clock on your phone. So check that out, Gym Boss Interval Timer. All right, answering the question now. Um, so favorite exercises if I don't have a machine or a hill? I would say the first one would be burpees. Um, although burpees kind of suck all around, I think they're a great hit workout. If you don't have any um, equipment or anything at all, you can pretty much do them from anywhere. The next one would probably be mountain climbers. They're another one where you can do them from really anywhere at all. Um, the next favorite one would probably be stair sprints. So if you do have a set of stairs, um, really you only need one set of stairs. You can kind of just sprint up and jog down, sprint up, jog down. Um, that's another good one. And then I guess my last favorite one, and obviously you need equipment for this one, but it's jump rope. So doing uh, not just regular jump rope, but double unders. So if you've ever done a CrossFit work about if you've ever done a CrossFit workout before, you probably know what double unders are. It's basically just what it says. Um, you're doing regular jump rope, but double the amount. So that's why they're called double double unders. I don't really know how, how else to explain it. But those really get your heart rate up. And those are a great, um, a great exercise to implement for a Tabata workout. So those would be my top four. Burpees, mountain climbers, stair sprints, jump rope. And that's, of course, if you don't have... Um, any machines or hills, I guess you need a staircase and jump rope for the last two. But um, if you don't have anything at all, burpees or mountain climbers are probably your best bet. Okay, next question. How does being a woman in your 50s affect keto, carb cycling, and metabolic flexibility? Okay, this is a loaded question. Um, There's a lot of different avenues we can go down with this, but I'm actually going to refer to the episode that I did with Dr. Jamie Seaman. We talk all about this subject in major detail. Um, So a few things that I'll mention here and some of the points that Dr. Jamie Seaman and I talk about on that episode, um, in general, just when we talk about a low carb lifestyle and living a low carb lifestyle or low carb keto lifestyle, there are so many different benefits specifically for women going through or about to go through menopause. So some of these benefits specifically include, specifically for women, again, going through menopause include lower inflammation, balanced blood sugar levels, improved mood, reduced risk of cognitive decline, which is super important. And then also just it allows you to kind of help control weight a little bit easier. And that's just from anecdotal anecdotal evidence and things like that with um, kind of going back to that blood sugar roller coaster that we always talk about, um, reduced insulin levels and things like that. So there are, uh, we know that chronic inflammation is really the cause, if not you know, the main cause of chronic diseases. So chronic inflammation can increase during menopause. So it's very critical to take steps to reduce or manage this inflammation. Inflammation. One of the most amazing benefits of following a low carb or keto lifestyle is its ability to drastically lower inflammation. So we know that it does this by reducing the amount of free radical production stabilizing blood sugar levels and also reducing insulin levels. So with lower levels of inflammation and also stabilized blood sugar levels, there's more room for healthy mitochondria. So if you don't know what mitochondria is, it's basically just the power and energy or energy powerhouses of our cells. It's where all of the energy is um, produced. So by reducing inflammation and improving mitochondrial function, you actually improve your risk factors for metabolic and other chronic diseases. So this is super important, especially um, with aging and things like that. 
Um, the next point I'll touch on is um, following a lower carb lifestyle reduces risk of cognitive decline. So women have estrogen receptors all throughout the body, including in our brains. And reduced signaling through these estrogen, estrogen receptors due to low estrogen levels in, meni- in menopause can leave brain cells more vulnerable to disease and dysfunction. Um, so that just kind of makes sense if you have reduced um, estrogen and reduced receptors, the signaling can um, kind of go haywire. Some studies actually show that women who go through menopause or, wow, I can't say that word, um, women who go through menopause or are in perimenopause have significantly lower levels of glucose metabolism in several key brain regions than those who were premenopausal. So estrogen loss means that the loss of you basically have loss of key neuroprotective elements in in your brain and a higher vulnerability to brain aging and more specifically um, Alzheimer's disease. So um, that's super important to kind of think about, right? So one of the functions of estrogen is to basically get glucose into your brain for fuel. So during menopause, estrogen levels, as we know, drop. Without estrogen, the ability of glucose to fuel the brain is actually diminished. So following a lower carb, lower carb lifestyle, following a, you know, a ketogenic diet and utilizing ketones rather than glucose for fuel can provide steady, clean energy to those brain cells. So that's one of the really main benefits of producing ketones and using them for fuel. Um, this can reduce menopausal symptoms like brain fog and hot flashes specifically. So ketones can also reduce uh, neurological inflammation by shutting down neuroinflammatory pathways. So that's super important to realize as well. And reducing neurological inflammation is very important because it's linked with depression, anxiety, and poor cognitive function. So that's just another uh, kind of reason why following a lower carb lifestyle can be super beneficial um, in terms of reducing risk of cognitive decline. The next one would be, you know, what I talked about, stabilizing blood sugar levels and improving mood. That's one of, you know, one of the many benefits of following the lower carb lifestyle. So many menopausal women experience mood swings, anxiety, and depression. This is, again, partly due to a decline in estrogen levels. Um, There are lots of estrogen receptors in the brain, and when estrogen levels decline in menopause, this can affect your mood and lead to emotional distress and, you know, depression and things like that. So, you know, consuming a high carbohydrate, high sugar diet will actually cause massive fluctuations in blood sugar levels, which we know can lead to rapid changes in your mood and behavior. We've talked about blood sugar and the blood sugar roller coaster many times on this podcast. So a low carb ketogenic diet or lifestyle decreases and stabilizes blood sugar and insulin levels, which can in turn have a positive impact on mood by providing your brain with a stable source of energy. So that's another one. I mean, we talked about that many, many times before on this podcast, but I just wanted to kind of reiterate that. And then when it comes to carb cycling during menopause, so for some, for some individuals eating, you know, a low carb diet for too long can lead to some problems. Um, Over long periods, your thyroid hormones may drop. You may become less sensitive to insulin. Other things can go on. You know, we talk about all this um, all the time, Um, and that's why this podcast is, you know, talking all about metabolic flexibility and how to bring carbs in strategically and what carbs to focus on while still, you know, maintaining a lower carb lifestyle. So carb cycling can optimize basically your, your body's metabolic needs and is a great strategy for women in menopause and just women in general. So I talked all about carb cycling, how to know if you might need to implement it, how to implement it, and all those things in a previous episode that I recorded. I'll link that in the show notes. It's called Carb Ups, Carb Cycling, and Building an Anti-Fragile Metabolism. And then we also need to consider other factors, you know, like physical activity, just, you know, how many steps you're getting throughout the day, how much movement you have, your exercise, if you're a resistance trainer or not, Um, and then, you know, just stress reduction techniques, improving sleep, all of this. So, you know, all these factors have a play and have a role um, in managing, you know, menopausal symptoms and things like that. 
So again, this is a loaded question. I do go into a lot of detail um, about hormones and all of this in my Keto for Women program. So if you haven't checked that out yet, I will link that in the show notes as well. I believe the next round will be in fall 2020. So if you're interested, you can definitely uh, sign up for the waiting list. Or if you're interested in working with me one-on-one, I'll link the application to one-on-one coaching in the show notes as well. Or you can go to my website. Um, All the information is there also. Okay, the next question. I eat mostly animal-based with carbs around workouts, but still can't see muscles well. Do you have any tips? Okay, so the first and the main tip would be, what is your salt and electrolyte intake like? So when I hear this question or when this is something that comes up, I always think about, okay, the first thing is salt, salt, salt. Are you getting enough salt? There are a few main reasons why you should, you know, well, there are many reasons why you should be consuming salt throughout the day, but there are a few main reasons why you should consider consuming salt pre-workout, even if you're not following a lower carb keto diet. So I'm just going to go through a few of those main reasons. The first one is it gives you a great pump, right? So sodium actually pulls water into your cells, including your muscle cells, and that causes them to expand and give you that pump that you're looking for. Um, When there's extra sodium in your bloodstream, it pulls water into your blood vessels, increasing the total amount of volume, um, sorry, increasing the total amount or the total volume of blood inside your blood vessels, aka increasing blood flow. Um, So that's where you get that pump from, and sodium is a major player in that. The second reason is maintaining membrane potential. So sodium is essential for the maintenance of membrane potential, which affects muscle contraction and also cardiac function. So that's another really important reason why we need adequate amounts of sodium, especially around our workouts. The next reason would be balancing electrolytes. So this is something that most people know, but as one of the main electrolytes in the human body, sodium intake can greatly influence electrolyte balance which can in turn also help prevent and reduce muscle cramps and things like that, um, specifically to working out, specifically when you're working out and obviously post-workout as well. And then the last reason would be it also, sodium also influences nutrient absorption, sorry, nutrient absorption and transport. So sodium influences the absorption of different nutrients such as amino acids, uh, water, glucose, basically all the in, all the nutrients that you're consuming these are all essential for a successful workout and then also you know a successful recovery so if you're not salting your food if you're not taking salt before your workout definitely definitely do that i would recommend either you know a quarter to a half a teaspoon of high quality sea salt with your pre-workout meal which would you know I mean, it doesn't have to be with your pre-workout meal, but you can do that. Or what I do is I just take a quarter or a half teaspoon of salt. I use Redmond Real Salt. I put it in my hand, um, chug it down with some water right before my workout, and I'm good to go. I also put like an extra pinch of salt in my water bottle um, to sip on throughout the workout. And, um, you know, it's always, always works for me. You could also, I know you mentioned that you include carbs, you know, around your workout. You could also try to increase that amount of carbs around your workout or try doing like a carb refeed day or a carb up day where you increase your carbs significantly on one day to help replenish your glycogen stores. So that could be another kind of tip. So really the main thing is making sure that you're having enough salt throughout the day and then also uh, pre-workout. So if you haven't done that yet, definitely try that out or If you have, maybe you need to increase the amount of salt um, or maybe play around with the amount of carbs you're consuming as well. Okay, next question. How long should you wait for keto intermittent fasting symptoms to subside regarding feeling higher stress, uh, heart rate, and sleep? Okay, so it can take a few days, sometimes a week or so, to for these symptoms especially if you're new to keto to kind of subside but they really shouldn't it really shouldn't be longer than that it shouldn't be you know it shouldn't be more than a week that you're going through kind of this keto flu that we talk about if it is you really need to evaluate more closely what you're doing so the main things would be your hydration status and especially i mean we talked about this just talked about it your salt replenishment your electrolyte replenishment you have to make sure those are in check 
Um, that's the number one thing that a lot of people kind of get wrong when they first, you know, follow a, a low carb or a keto diet. Um, also, are you eating enough? Like, are you getting enough energy and calories in general? That will also affect how you're feeling. Um, and then, you know, what are your food? What's your food look like? Is it high quality food, high quality fats, or is it mo mostly packaged foods? So focusing more on whole foods versus packaged foods, focusing more on the healthy fats versus the unhealthy fats. Um, I'm not going to dive into all that right now, but I will link a blog post I wrote on um, the differences. I dive into all the differences between the different fats and things like that. Um, I believe it's called The Truth About Dietary Fat, so I will link that in the show notes. You can check that out. But those are the things that I would you know, think about. If you're still if you still have symptoms of the keto flu and it's been a week or two of kind of following a lower carb diet or a keto diet, definitely assess these things. Start with hydration and electrolytes. Make sure those are in check. Make sure you're eating enough. Um, make sure your food is high quality and make sure you're getting high quality fats as well. So if you're just eating, you know, bunless cheeseburgers from McDonald's, um, that's probably not the best. Um, so we need to kind of think about that. There is a difference between a well-formulated ketogenic diet and a lazy ketogenic diet. People have success doing lazy or quote unquote dirty keto, but it's probably not the most optimal. And I would say that if you're suffering from symptoms of the keto flu continuously, then we really need to look into those things. So hopefully that made sense. Okay, last question for today. What is a supplement that everyone should have? Okay, this is another loaded question. Um, so the first thing I'll say is you always want to just, you know, first you want to start with getting your nutrients from food as much as possible. So you should not be relying on supplements to, um, I would say, get your nutrients from. So the most nutrient-dense foods and the most bang for your buck are going to be from getting your food from local farms, so from your local farmer's market, focusing on properly raised animal products, focusing on organic veggies and fruits, the ones that are in season, um, and then also a variety of healthy fats. So that's going to be your main kind of where, you, where you're going to get the most bang for your buck in terms of nutrients. Um, if you make the conscious effort to focus on whole foods like this and getting them from the right places, your need for supplementation will likely drop compared to someone else's need who, you know, maybe if you're just eating bunless cheeseburgers from McDonald's every day, you're probably not getting adequate nutrients. Um, and then even if you are eating, you know, properly raised animal products, local organic veggies, things like that, um, you probably still may need to supplement with certain things. And I'm going to dive into why in a second. Um, there are some supplements that are almost universally needed just because of today's environment, because of our stress levels in this modern society that we live in, and then also just the lack of nutrients in our food supply. So that's something that we need to think about. Um, it's different than it was, you know, 100 years ago. Our food supply has completely changed. Um, so I'm going to chat about a few of the supplements that I recommend most people at least look into based on what we know most people tend to be deficient in nowadays. Again, this, you know, this is just my personal opinion based on the research I've done. Um, I do plan on, you know, taking a deeper dive into supplements in a later episode and potentially having some experts on to interview, um, that are really, you know, just are are experts in the supplement space. So stay tuned for that. But really the first kind of, I guess, I don't know, there's so many, not, not so many, but there are, there are so many different supplements out there. Um, so I, these are just a few that I would say, um, are the main ones that I would definitely look into. So the first one would be talking about minerals and electrolytes, which we talked about a lot in this episode, but um, minerals are basically what drive all of the cellular processes in our bodies, right? So from creating energy to sending nerve impulses and everything in between. So one of the minerals that is super important, and it's actually the second most common deficiency we see in our world today, is magnesium. So the, the, most, the first most common deficiency is vitamin D, which I'm going to talk about in a second. But magnesium is found naturally in plants and some animal foods, which 
they absorb from those plants or from the soil. But magnesium is also the most depleted mineral in our soils due to the increased use of pesticides and herbicides, soil erosion, and a bunch of other factors that, you know, go back to our modern food, uh, food supply and food chain, things like that. So that in itself tells us why it's probably the number two most common deficiency. So here's a quick stat for you that I just, that I looked up, not just the second, but right before I recorded this episode, um, if we look at the calcium magnesium ratio back in the early 1900s, it was actually one to one, the which was the optimal ratio of magnesium to calcium. And today we have a ratio of anywhere between five to one and 15 to one, which is not good. Um, this is simply because, again, of the modern environment we live in, and it's actually estimated that 75% of Americans aren't getting enough magnesium, and that's three out of every four people, which obviously is a very high number. Um, And again, this is likely because our nutrient-depleted soils, um, but likely because of our nutrient-depleted soils, um, a low intake of magnesium-rich foods, and basically a high intake of refined, processed, sugar, crap foods. And so when we're talking about supplementing with magnesium, there are so many different types of magnesium supplements out there, And it can be super overwhelming and actually really confusing um, if you have no idea what to look for. So the different types have different functions, and I won't get into all of that now because that in itself could be its own podcast. Like we we could do a whole podcast on just magnesium, but I will talk about, you know, what to look for. So the most important thing to consider when choosing any supplement, actually, is the bioavailability. And this just basically means the degree to which that supplement is absorbed and used in your body. So the last thing you want is to, you know, be spending money on supplements that your body is just using or or isn't using and just peeing out. That would just be expensive pee. Um, so that's not what we want. So I'm quickly going to mention the best types versus the inferior types so you can get at least an idea of what to look for for magnesium. So The types that you would want to avoid, or the main type you want to avoid for magnesium would be magnesium oxide. Um, Those magnesium oxide, magnesium aspartate, sulfate, and carbonate, these are very poorly absorbed. So definitely avoid those. Um, The best type would probably be, the best different, the best types of magnesium would probably be uh, glycinate, malate, chloride, taurate, uh, citrate, and L-threonate. And based on the current recent current research, magnesium glycinate and magnesium citrate are the most absorbable or bioavailable forms. Um, those are also very com- very common. Um, but again, the different types do different things. Um, I'm not again. I'm not going to get into all of that right now. But really, just in general, you know, thinking about the absorption rate and the uh, bioavailability is the most important thing that you you should you should think about. So. Uh, magnesium glycinate and magnesium citrate are are good options. Um, And dosing usually ranges from about 300 to about 450 milligrams per day, depending on specific needs. Um, Again, we can do an entire podcast on magnesium, which maybe I'll do in the future um, if you're interested, or again, have some experts on who uh, study this or study supplements for a living, and that's the only thing they do. So that would be cool. I'll definitely look into that and, and um, yeah, stay tuned for that. So the next uh, mineral electrolyte, which I've already talked about a lot on this episode, is sodium or salt. So if you're following like a standard American diet, you probably don't need to worry about, you know, supplementing with sodium because there's tons of sodium in processed foods and things like that, which is, you know, standard American diet or what we're what we're used to here in America. But if you are following, you know, a lower carb, keto, paleo, or just eating, you know, whole foods in general, you probably do need to supplement with salt. Um, Basically, that just means adding salt to your food or just adding salt throughout the day. Again, high quality salt, not just the table salt that you find, you know, in the grocery store, but really focusing on high quality sea salt. Again, I use Redmond Real Salt. Um, If you haven't heard of them, they are a local company in Utah. Amazing, amazing quality product. Um, I talk about them all the time when I post about them all the time on Instagram because I use their salt obviously every day. So again, with sodium, just make sure you're getting high quality sodium or salt. Um, And, you know, when your body lacks sodium, it will actually pull it from, from your bones to maintain 
normal sodium blood levels. And the body will also push magnesium out in sweat to preserve that sodium as well. So this just means that, you know, if you are depleted in salt, it can actually lead to magnesium deficiencies as well. So adequate salt, in, adequate salt intake can help prevent magnesium deficiency. And again, it's also super important for keeping your basically electrical and your electrical kind of machinery in balance within your body. Um, so sodium and magnesium are super important and sodium in itself is super important because it can actually, if you get enough salt and sodium, you can actually prevent um, the loss of magnesium. So that's something to think about. Um, another, you know, kind of quick tip in regards to salt and sodium. For me, if I ever notice that I have a headache or I'm feeling a little groggy or lightheadedness, that usually means that my electrolytes are kind of out of balance. So I will take a little bit of salt. I'll just, you know, a quarter teaspoon of salt, chug it down with some water, especially if I have a headache. And, you know, nine out of 10 times that headache will completely go away. So next time you get a headache or you're feeling lightheaded, Take some high quality salt, chug it down with some water and see what happens. Um, I'm pretty sure it will, it will go away. So something to think about. So the next supplement I would say is in terms of, well, we just mentioned it. It's the number one common deficiency is vitamin D. So it's another supplement that we could probably dedicate an entire podcast to or even multiple podcasts, but I'll just give you kind of the cliff notes version here. So we can obtain vitamin D naturally through food and sunlight, which I'm sure you've heard of. The issue is that most of us obviously don't get enough time out in the sun. Um, plus we're lathering on sunscreen, which I'm not even gonna get into all that right now. I talked about that with Dr. Ken Berry. We talked about the truth about sunscreen. If you haven't checked out that episode, um, we'll link it as well in the show notes. But um, just getting sunshine is something that's not very common nowadays because we're all just, you know, in our offices all day long, um, not usually getting out and in the sun. And then also, if we talk about food, the amount of vitamin D is really negligible. I can't say that word, negligible in most foods we eat. Um, Basically, yeah, most foods outside of fatty fish. Um, So as a result, vitamin D deficiency is extremely common. And as mentioned, it's the first most common deficiency we see in our modern society and even our modern world. Um, Actually, it's currently estimated that 70% of the people in the United States have a vitamin D deficiency, while over 40% of the global population are deficient. So there's also a strong correlation between vitamin D levels and immune function. So it's not a coincidence that, you know, the hype around supplementing vitamin D has pretty much skyrocketed during this whole coronavirus stuff. Um, if you've you know seen any of that, that's that's the reason. Um, taking a vitamin D3 or cod liver oil supplement can be helpful in obviously preventing vitamin D deficiency. But before supplementing, you should you know make sure you're getting sufficient sunlight, you know sun exposure, doing all those things first, um, eating as much vitamin D rich foods as you can, and then also you should consider getting your levels tested before you start supplementing. Um, You don't want to be supplementing on top of, you know, if you already have adequate vitamin D levels, um, that can be a not so great thing. So if you're concerned with this, definitely ask your doctor if you can just test for your uh, levels of vitamin D. If you are deficient, um, cod liver oil is a great place to start in terms of supplementing. Um, So for my research, cod liver oil seems to be the single best source of vitamin D and even just having one tablespoon can give you more than you need per day. Um, And then also fatty fish like salmon is also good, but you would need to pretty much eat that every single day to get an adequate amount, which is unlikely for most of us, especially when we're talking about like wild and sustainably caught salmon. Um, So again, get your levels tested if you're concerned Um, which you probably should get your levels tested because, again, it's the number one deficiency in the world. Um, So getting a good quality cod liver supplement is your best bet on that as well. Um, The next thing I will mention, vitamin K. So actually combining vitamin D with vitamin K2 is important because of how they work together in your body. So vitamin D3 and vitamin K2 play an essential role in calcium uptake into your uh, skeletal bone tissue. So there's several studies that that have actually shown a synergistic effect 
between vitamin K and vitamin D3, and that's why you'll likely see these together in a supplement. Usually if you go on Amazon, you Google, or sorry, go on Amazon and you look up vitamin D3 supplements, you'll notice that there are a lot that combine with vitamin K2. Um, this is because they work synergistically together. Um, if you are just consuming vitamin D3, you should probably add a K2 to that as well to help with that bioavailability, help with the absorption of that vitamin D3. Um, and there are two main types of vitamin K2. Uh, you'll probably see MK4 and MK7. MK7 is the biologically active form of vitamin K. So I would look for that um, and you know include that in your vitamin D supplement if you don't already have it. Um, and then also vitamin K2 can also, you know, be found in foods. Again, it's negligible, not negligible, well, yeah, it's negligible because of just, again, our modern food supply, but things like green leafy veggies, green leafy vegetables, fermented vegetables, as well as, like I mentioned, fatty animal-based foods like liver, egg yolk, and cheese. Those are where you would find um, vitamin K. And again, vitamin D3 and vitamin K2 are their most bioactive and bioavailable forms for your body to absorb. So if you are supplementing with these, make sure that, that it is vitamin D3 and vitamin K2, specifically with vitamin K2, the MK7 form. So there are other supplements that I recommend as well, but this, this episode is already pretty long. Um, so I'm not going to dive into all of those right now. Maybe I'll go into them in another another time in, in more depth. Um, but just to give you a quick preview of the others that I was thinking about in terms of importance and effectiveness, you know, in, in terms of the supplement hierarchy, the next one would be fish oil. So it's important to have the ratio of omega-3s to omega-6 fats balanced within our body. And most of the population has a very high ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 due to all the vegetable oils and processed crap in our food supply. So, you know, supplementing with a fish oil supplement to help increase that omega-3 to omega-6 ratio is important. But with this uh, fish oil, there's so many different things I can dive into here because not all of the supplements are created equal. So you have to be careful with the fish oil supplement that you, you know, that you consume. If you're taking cod liver oil, you can pretty much kill two birds with one stone here. So cod liver oil, again, is, uh, as the name implies, it comes from the livers of cod fishes. Um, more, more specifically, Atlantic cod and Pacific cod are most commonly used to make cod liver oil. And cod liver oil contains high levels of EPA and, D and DHA which we absolutely need, that's, that's important. Those are essential fatty acids that we need and, that will, and those are those omega-3, uh, sorry, those are what will help balance that omega-3 to omega-6 ratio and then also just we need those essential fatty acids. So if you don't get those from your diet, which a lot of people don't, um, supplementing with that is important. Um, and then also the cod liver oil does have vitamin D and vitamin A as well. So, you know, if you're, I said I wasn't going to dive into all of this, but fish oil, there's so many different things we can go into, but if you are taking a cod liver oil supplement, you're pretty much killing two birds with one stone when it comes to uh, fish oil and, or sorry, when it comes to omega-3s and vitamin D. The next supplement would be creatine. So it's one of the most research, researched and safe performance and cognition enhancing supplements that we have, like literally creatine is probably the most researched supplement on the market. Um, and if you don't know what creatine is, our bodies use creatine phosphate as a fuel source for basically the first few seconds of intense or explosive exercise. So you can think of supplementing with creatine as basically kind of like topping off the tank. It may allow you to maintain high intensity exercise for slightly longer. Um, this again is probably more for people who exercise and lift weights and resistance training on a daily basis. Um, but there are also other benefits beyond just muscle building and performance in terms of cognitive benefits as well. So creatine would be another one. And then the last one I would say, or maybe second to last one, would be collagen peptides. So they've become super popular lately. Collagen protein makes up about 90% of our connective tissue. So our joints, ligaments, tendons, fascia, all of that as well as obviously our skin and bones. And as we age, our body actually slows the production of collagen. 
And unlike our, you know, our ancestors who were consuming nose to tail animal foods, most of us are probably um, not doing that. And that would, that would mean that we're deficient in the amino acids that actually come from those collagen rich fuels, specifically glycine would be that would be one of the main amino acids that we're deficient in. Um, and if you don't have enough glycine, you're actually more prone to, or you're potentially more prone to soft tissue injuries and lower production of glutathione, which is actually the most important antioxidant in our body. Um, so if you're not consuming collagen rich foods on a daily basis, things like real bone broth, like real homemade bone broth, um, made from real bones, not just the, uh, you know, broth that you find on the grocery store shelves, which are basically just water that have flavoring in them. They're not real bone broth, so you stay away from those. Um, so if you're not consuming real bone broth, if you're not consuming fish like sardines and mackerel, ma sorry, sardines and mackerel on a daily basis or egg yolks on a daily basis, then supplementing with collagen might be something that you want to look into. And then also if you're eating a lot of meats, you know, muscle meats and things like that, which you should be, that's important. Supplementing with collagen can actually help balance out the ratio of glycine to methionine. Methionine is the main amino acid found in muscle meat and glycine is basically the main amino acid found in collagen. And so if you have, if that balance is off, um, that can cause some issues. So if you're eating tons of muscle meat, you probably want to supplement with collagen to help balance out that amino acid profile. And then the last thing I will say, which I won't dive into too much, but beef liver. So beef liver has so many nutrients in it. Um, a lot of people refer to it now as nature's multivitamin. Most multivitamins out there on the market are absolute crap. Um, it's impossible to fit all of the, uh, all of the, you know, effective doses of those vitamins that you need into one or two small multivitamin pills. So mostly any multivitamin that you see on the market is usually, you know, unless you're taking, unless it says that the dosage is like six tablets or six pills, anything under that is usually underdosed and just expensive pee pretty much. So if you're looking for the ultimate multivitamin, it would probably be beef liver. Nowadays they make beef liver capsules and things like that. Um, I know Equip Foods makes those, Ancestral Supplements makes the beef liver capsules if you don't want to just eat straight beef liver. Um, but yeah, so that's what I would say in terms of, I know that was a long-winded answer to that question. There are so many supplements out there, but those would be like, in terms of hierarchy, those would be the ones that I would first look into before looking into anything else, um, just based off of the research I've done and the deficiencies that we see um, you know, nowadays and all of the things I just mentioned, those are the kind of the reasons why I would start with those. Again, I'll probably do another episode that, or maybe multiple episodes that dive into supplements and hopefully have some, ex some experts on um, that can dive a little bit deeper into these as well. And then also in terms of the brands that I recommend, we always have to, you know, be cognizant of the supplements we're taking. The supplement industry can be super shady, um, so you have to make sure that you are getting a high quality brand for any supplement that you're taking. So I'm going to link my Amazon shop page and my products page on my website in the show notes so you can see um, the brands that I recommend and that I use and um, check those out if you're interested. So again, I'll link those in the show notes and look for look forward to hopefully another another episode diving into more more on supplements in hopefully the near future so that was all the questions i hope i answered your questions um if you're you know if you have any other questions always always feel free to reach out um, i post a question box on mondays on my instagram and you can always email me um, if you have specific questions that you want me to dive into on the podcast and as always, if you're enjoying the podcast, make sure to share it out with your friends and family. And then also check out my website, uh, www.killingitketo.com for lots of other resources, blog posts, recipes. Um, also, you can check out my nutrition and exercise programs. If you are interested in you know, working one-on-one -on -one with me, you can fill out a one-on-one -on -one application and that's all on my website. All right, I hope you enjoyed the episode and learned some things. And I'll see you next time.